Right then. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you very much for sparing the time to join us today and uh, in today's webinar and out of your busy days. Uh, those who don't know me, I'm Tim Kellett, and um, I'm from uh, Paydata, and uh, we are a reward management consultancy for those who don't uh, know us, and we specialise in uh, providing salary and ben benefits uh, benchmarking information. Uh, we've got a range of other reward services, but I, I guess the mo most pertinent one today is uh, that in the top left uh, top left hand corner is business insight. So we provide uh, market trends and business insight to people. And that's what today's uh, webinar is about, uh, specifically the new ways of working. Um, uh, just a bit of housekeeping at the beginning of uh, today's session. Uh, so we've muted everyone's microphones. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, try and hold them to the end and then uh, uh, there is a Q&A section. Uh, we're, we're going to finish at 11 o'clock and we have allowed some time at, uh, before then to answer some questions right at the end of the, uh, the webinar. Um, but um, if we run out of time, we will uh, come back to people individually and collectively and uh, provide uh, some uh, um, that there are answers to the, the, the questions. I will make available today's slides after the, um, the session and uh, a recording of the webinar as well. Uh, so uh, I think that's, that's everything set from that side of things. I've introduced myself, but I'd also like to introduce um, our friends at uh, Gowling, uh, international law firm, uh, Anna Fletcher, who's the legal director there. And uh, I'm very, um, you know, we're, we're really grateful to have Anna's expertise today, really to, to give the legal perspective uh, of the new ways of working. So thank you very much for joining today, Anna. Uh, and um, and uh, so really on to the, um, I guess, the <laughs> where I'm most comfortable, the market trends analysis. So I, I thought I'd kick things off to give some provide, uh, provide some information about uh, what's going on uh, in terms of market trends. And uh, if we think about the new ways of working, ov obviously yesterday was the um, uh, uh, marked a year since the first lockdown with a national day of reflection and obviously employers when we went into the first lockdown all those uh, that year ago uh, most employers were looking at um, you know how, do, how are we going to address this initially how are we going to deal with this first lockdown but by the time we get into the summer and the late summer uh, many employers were saying okay well how's this going to work what's the new way of working going forward and indeed we've been uh, surveying uh, a lot of this sort of information Information from employers since um, the early autumn time. So, uh, and it's also been obviously a hot topic for discussion at um, many of our HR workshops as well. So, we've collected a lot, a lot of information over time, um, but specifically ahead of today's session, we thought we'd run a, a short online survey. Uh, we had a robust uh, sample, over 130 organisations. And I guess the thing about um, uh, the, the results I'm just going to present to you now is that um, uh, it was a, it's a really good overall representation, a broad cross-section of UK business. Uh, and so what I'm about to present provides a really good cross-section of, you know, how people see the new ways of working. And one of the first questions we asked was, when do you think you're going to return to the office? And uh, you can see on the graph here, this is a percentage of organisations who completed this question and what they thought in terms of the different coloured bars are about what percentage of their total workforce would be coming back to the office. And you can sort of see most organisations believe that uh, the majority of people would return to the office probably around September time. There's a there's a little there's a, a gradual movement, as you can see, from sort of June onwards. Uh, but it's really when you get to September that the green bars are in uh, ascendancy. And you can see that's where most people expect most of their uh, people to return um, uh, to the office. Uh, likewise, uh, we also asked, OK, well, we've got um, uh, people returning to the office. How much time do you think they're going to be spending once they get back to the office? And it's interesting that most people say that over sort of July and August that uh, most people will be spending most of their time uh, in the office. So you can see the green bars start to come into a, a ascendancy quite early there after um, the sort of the most restrictions are released in mid-June. Uh, obviously, I think most the 
caveat is most people will, uh, it's, it depends on what uh, what the, uh, the government's guidance uh, will be uh, as well. It's really interesting that even though when you get to the end of uh, this year, 2021, the biggest bar there is 60%. So most organisations by the end of the year expect uh, em employees to spend 60% of their time in the office. And that really does back up uh, what people have mentioned in our, our, in our HR groups and anecdotally that they probably they they expect most employees to return to the office two to three days a week, uh, depending on the sort of the role, obviously. So that's that's an interesting trend as well, um, and sort of backs up uh, what what we've been talking to people about. Then in terms of uh, coming back to the office, I think employers obviously are very uh, um, conscious about safety and what measures they want to put into place uh, to protect employees. Uh, so there's there's definitely a, a trend here in terms of flexible or voluntary return to the office, um, but also looking at managing capacity. So that's through primarily through booking of desks uh, uh, as well. It's interesting because we've asked we asked exactly the same question question over the autumn and um, when I looked at the results of this, uh, actually, most of the uh, the results we've got here now are uh, uh, were, haven't really changed from the autumn time. I think the biggest changes is perhaps a little bit more caution from employers. So you can see uh, the sort of delays in uh, uh, shielding employees returning to the office, uh, short, perhaps perhaps looking at perhaps shorter working days in the office, and uh, actually the use of COVID wardens to um, to enforce that. That seems to be uh, um, more common than in the autumn time, which is probably natural considering after the autumn we had another lockdown. So, um, uh, so def definitely a focus on flexibility and on uh, protection of employees around capacity. And then lastly, we asked uh, organisations about, OK, uh, the new ways of working, you know, what's that going to look like in the long term? And there were two areas here, perhaps unsurprisingly, first uh, looking at uh, sort of flexibility about working and the uh, and you know, people were being able to use regional offices or coming in uh, two to three days a week. But also the nature of what is the office going to be uh, about going forward? And it's very much about, and again, this has come anecdotally from people, it's about it's around using the office as a collaborative hub a social hub and that, that's obviously what a lot of people have been lo uh, lacking in the meantime uh, these zoom and teams calls are all very well but actually what people are missing are those coffee machine chats so that's definitely coming through uh, on there and obviously you've got that reduced office space there you know managing that capacity as well in a safe way so those were the sort of uh, main highlights from that survey as I said uh, we'll, we'll send out a link uh, for the survey afterwards if you've not filled it in so far uh, please do so I'm sure you'll find the results very useful so so um, that's everything from my point of view. I'm going to now hand over to the expert, Anna, uh, to talk about uh, things from a legal perspective. So um, over to you, Anna, and I'll see if I can try and give you control. I um, don't know if you've got control or not. If not, we'll have to do a Chris Whitty, won't we? I think we might have to do a Chris Whitty. <laughs> not at all. That, that's fine. So good morning, everybody. Um, it's uh, great to be involved in this webinar. So. Um, if we can move on, Tim, um, I'm going to look at the new ways of working, and this is my uh, broad agenda for this session. Um, so essentially, uh, what do we know so far? Um, and actually, without giving too much away, a lot of uh, the survey results that Tim has just shared with you um, are very much uh, in line with other surveys that have been carried out by the organisations. Um, what do you as employers need to be thinking about in terms of actions to be taken going forward? location-based pay, which uh, might well be quite a contentious issue. And, and then I just want to touch on sustainability because it's a very important consideration at the moment. So uh, we're now gonna move on to look at uh, what do we need, know so far. Um, who would have known that you know only a year ago, um, the normal way of working, we would have expected to people being in offices, working on sites with some degree of flexibility built into that. Uh, and then literally overnight, uh, for many organisations, we moved from uh, that traditional way of working perhaps to a totally remote working arrangement. Um, obviously within some industries, um, that wasn't the case and, and some uh, of our clients certainly found that they continued working um, with, say, with uh, COVID uh, secure arrangements in place, obviously, 
but for lots of people, including our firm, um, we went from office to home literally overnight. So the question really is what does the future hold? Do we think that uh, there's going to be a move to remote working completely? There have been some quite high profile um, statements, uh, including statements from Goldman Sachs saying that remote working is an aberration. Um, I think you need to put that in the context of uh, the circumstances being described there. That was really around a graduate cohort and, and how do new starters, particularly uh, graduates, integrate into the workplace? Um, how do they learn the skills that they need? How do they work in a collaborative way if we're all working remotely? So I think it's fair to say that we, we, we don't expect a, the, the uh, position as it is now for most employers to continue. What we expect is a more um, hybrid arrangement, focusing on office-based work, perhaps the collaboration, home-based work, depending on the sort of tasks that are best undertaken when you have that, uh, perhaps that sort of quiet space in which to focus. Um, but um, certainly some greater degree of flexibility going forward. So this idea of hybrid or, or sort of blended um, arrangements in place. So moving on, uh, we, we know that uh, there have been um, lots of uh, statements and, and, and comments made by various organisations uh, in the relatively recent past about what they're going to do in terms of working practices going forward. So back at the end of February, um, the Financial Times reported on a survey that uh, they carried out, uh, which suggested that of the 20 organisations they'd surveyed, um, there was a great deal of analysis being undertaken. Um, organizations like Virgin Media uh, had uh, made it clear that they were looking at things like uh, future working strategies because they saw that uh, we needed to work out how, uh, as an organization uh, and, and companies and employers, we're going to move out of um, this sort of enforced remote working. And Deutsche Bank are doing something very similar, um, developing their own hybrid working models. Lots of organizations have embarked on surveys. Um, so we know that, for example, um, PwC have surveyed its own workforce, 22,000 UK employees, um, to work out what they would see the future world of work looking like. So a real piece around engagement. Um, and it certainly looks like it's going to be a fully hybrid model. Other organizations have set up forums and working parties to engage with the workforce. Um, and, and we as an organisation, as a firm, um, we have a variety of um, streams of uh, work being undertaken under the banner of uh, future ways of working. Um, and I think it's very important from an engagement perspective uh, to be focusing in that way. Um, some organisations have also talked about uh, undertaking working trials. Um, the Lloyds Banking Group indicated that in late spring, so in a few months time, um, they would be starting to look at staff working um, in a more hybrid way from home. And, and other organisations have already committed to new working models. So again, NatWest, and you'll see there's a bit of a theme here in the financial services sector, but NatWest have talked about um, home working when staff return to uh, kind of a more office uh, environment, um, uh, sort of autumn time, I suspect, looking at the results of the survey that Paydata has carried out. Um, that seems to be uh, what people are talking about at the moment, which is a sort of September, October return, um, which I guess allows for the period when people would be on the summer holiday break, um, depending obviously whether we can actually go anywhere on summer holidays, that I can't predict. And, and why are organisations looking at this? Well, I think the scepticism around remote working, that it would be fair to say existed in some pockets before uh, the advent of COVID, I think that myth has really been smashed because we found out that overnight we can move to these ways of working, that we can be productive, that we can continue to deliver our services um, to ensure that the business uh, model uh, is successful. So lots of organisations, again, talking in terms of the ability to deliver uh, for staff as well as being able to deliver for customers and clients. Uh, and so I think that you know, it's recognised that you know, we can do different types of work in different environments and actually we should really capitalise on the learnings uh, over the last 12 months. 
So moving on, what do we know about uh, how employees feel? Um, I think this survey by YouGov is quite interesting. It'd be interesting um, if we were in a, in a live audience to do a show of hands. How many of us are happier working from home? Um, according to this survey, 46% of those who responded were happier working from home. Now that might be for all sorts of reasons. It might be that you don't have to do your long commute, uh, get up uh, with something horrible in front of the clock every morning. It might be to do with the fact that you can see more of your um, family, even if you can't see your friends at the moment. It might be that it allows you to engage in the hobbies that you enjoy. It just makes you happier. And that's a great thing. And that, again, is something which I think needs to be capitalised on. However, the, the downside is this whole piece around uh, people having a sense that their hours of work have increased. I, I think that the natural divide between home and work doesn't exist so much anymore. You know, a few paces and you're from the kitchen straight through to where you're working. If you're not already, you're obviously working in the kitchen. You don't have that break that you normally get, that traditionally we'd have found that time to kind of unwind when you leave the office and you arrive at home. So perhaps there is that sense that people uh, have uh, felt that hours of work have increased. 52% of people taking less breaks. Um, I would have to put my hand up to that. We, we don't have that natural wandering off to the coffee machine or the water cooler, the time to have conversations with colleagues. That kind of collaboration where you get up and, and you go and sort of gather together a group of people, or disappear off into a, into a quiet space and just talk about a particular issue that might be troubling you. Going off to meeting rooms. Our meeting rooms are our desks if you are working from home and you're dealing with Zoom or Teams meetings. So I think that um, is probably not a very good thing and certainly from a health and wellbeing perspective, not a great thing either. And then 53% of people responding that they felt that they really needed to be available at all times. And, and that again is this blurring of the lines between uh, work and home. I, I read a comment where somebody had, had reported to uh, their organisation that they felt it wasn't so much working from home, it was um, sleeping in the office, which is a pretty sad reflection of how people might be perceiving this. So I think that I'll come to health and well-being, but it's really important to make sure if we move to a hybrid model that we turn, whether we can turn those um, those uh, red segments uh, blue, uh, and make sure that people are continuing to be happy with a blended approach to working. So moving on to the next slide, this is about the workspaces of the future. So so do people still want offices? Um, I think it's fair to say that the answer to that for most people is yes. Um, it is an opportunity to collaborate with colleagues. It is an opportunity to share ideas, discuss problems, engage with people that you might not ordinarily come across in your personal life. Um, so the diversity of the office is, is really key. Um, and it's really key to organisations, particularly where creativity is required. Um, what's better than brainstorming issues and doing it in a face-to-face -face way? So I don't think that we will see the end of the office. I think that we'll see a different focus. It'll depend on the tasks that you have to perform. And so as a result of that, I think that we know that some employers are thinking about reducing their office space, their office footprint. Um, and again, in the banking sector, we're seeing this HSBC talking about not renewing leases when they come up for renewal. Um, uh, BT, for example, talking about reducing the number of its offices from 300 to 30. So the office space isn't dead, um, but I think it will be used in a very different way. And that really brings me on to this issue around options. Um, a lot of organisations have already moved to a, a sort of hot desking arrangement, and that might continue to be the case going forward. I do think that uh, there are uh, issues then in relation to how that's managed um, and there will necessarily be concerns about ensuring that hot desking, um, if that's going to be your preferred option, um, works for everybody. Um, there will be flexible choice, there needs to be a mixed space, people will be undertaking different tasks, um, people will be coming together in different ways. It may be that your flexibility is about bringing together 
um, teams on certain days where there isn't a necessarily a crossover between those teams um, so that you can have people in the office and people, um, and that's everybody from a team in the office, um, but only doing that on several days a week. It might be about converting some of the space that you've had, uh, which has been, for, for example, um, underutilized um, and creating hubs and so on. Um, there's some mention of something called cubicalized in working environments where you just have multiple spaces. And then for some organizations, we may well see a full return to the office, albeit there may still be some flexibility about how people actually work from home. You need to find out what works best for your organization and one of the ways of doing that is to engage with the workforce. So the next slide covers off the uh, topics I want to talk about in terms of the hybrid working considerations, because there are clearly lots of them. Um, and I'm sure depending on um, what your uh, role entails, some of these will be um, particularly pertinent. So moving on to this issue around senior leadership support and the next slide. Um, this is an interesting quote, which I'll let you read. I think what it demonstrates is that where we have learned through the experience of the last 12 months, ways in which we can engage, ways which work really well for our businesses, we shouldn't abandon that and we shouldn't just return to what it was like before the 23rd of March, 2020. Um, if we can change, and, and that can be led by um, senior management teams in a way that has been really beneficial for the, your businesses to date, um, why would you want to move away from that? So moving on to the issue around uh, policies, procedures and documents. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that I'm sure you're all thinking about at the moment. Um, for some of our clients, we have seen a real change in the way in which recruitment has been uh, dealt with over the last 12 months because you haven't had the benefit of that face-to-face -face interview with a candidate. And, and that may well continue going forward. We know that candidates are very keen uh, to see that organizations are offering flexibility. So will you go out there and actually say that you are going to be offering uh, a hybrid working arrangement? It may be that that then of course attracts a wider talent pool. So in terms of the actual process itself, uh, we need to be really mindful about how the process works, ensuring that candidates know the platforms that you're going to be using, making sure that if there are adjustments that are needed, so for example, for disabled candidates, that you're being very clear about those uh, and the fact that you're able to offer adjustments and adaptations where necessary. It may be about additional time for people to complete assessments if that's part of your recruitment process. It might be about allocating somebody to help that person with the technology that's involved or sending documents out in large print, for example, um, it might be about changing interview times, sorts of things that we'll probably will have already thought about in the context of the old world, but we need to be really focused on. And, and I know from our own team, um, two of our newest recruits, um, two of our uh, newly qualified lawyers were, were interviewed uh, and the recruitment process dealt with remotely. That's going to be an experience I suspect that most of you have had. Um, do we want to move away from that? Can we find a, a, a combined blended approach that works for your organization? And then thinking about the induction process, again, uh, making sure that if you've got somebody where adjustments are required, if there are adjustments that are required in the office and also at home, that all of that has been sorted out before day one, so that when people arrive, they feel that they've been included and thought about. Uh, and what about the idea of having induction buddies? If we are going to be in a remote working environment for a bit longer, um, it's really difficult to build those personal connections and those personal relationships, just to understand the kind of, the, not the politics of the organisation, but just how things are done around here. It's very difficult to put that into writing in many cases. So actually thinking about how do we convey that so that people feel that you know, they've had a very positive uh, experience on induction. Um, employment contracts. Um, there's an issue, and I come back to this in relation to return to work, but employment contracts, you know, do you need to look at changes in terms of changing people's places of work? 
Um, and does that actually trigger a requirement for your uh, staff who've been employed or who were employed before April 2020 to issue a new Section 1 statement, um, given the changes that came into force last year? That's one thing to think about. And then a really important consideration, I think, in relation to requiring people to return to the office. There may be employees who take the view that the arrangements that have been in place over the last 12 months effectively amount to a permanent change to their contract of employment. That's probably not the case, certainly in relation to the first lockdown, because, of course, that was mandated by the government's instruction that we all work from home where we can or where we could. Um, but with subsequent lockdowns, perhaps there's a bit more of an argument. I, I would take the view that the pandemic is, a, is an exceptional circumstance, um, not the sort of situation that leads to a permanent change to an individual's contract of employment. But of course, if you have an individual who is refusing to return, you need to understand why. So you need to be speaking to that person because it could be that um, they have concerns uh, from a health perspective, that they aren't reassured about the safety measures that you're going to put in place when uh, people are back in the office. You need to be thinking about avoiding disability discrimination claims. Um, but we do know from a recent decision from the Employment Tribunal in, in Leeds um, that actually uh, an individual who was refusing to return to the office on the basis of uh, an argument that uh, there was a serious uh, and imminent risk to that person's uh, health, um, that claim uh, failed. Uh, on the basis of the employer was able to demonstrate that they had made the adjustments that were necessary. So disciplinary action, I suppose, is the last resort. It, it's not the most attractive place to be. Uh, and hopefully by talking and engaging with your uh, reluctant employees, you're able to uh, persuade them that actually it's perfectly fine for them to return to the office or you make the adjustments that they might need. Um, and then when we come on to the issue about um, remote and work uh, and working or hybrid working policies, um, I'm going to look at flexible working a little bit later. But here, I think the issue is if you've already got a home working policy, that policy can be adapted. But you might want to have a hybrid working policy going forward so that everybody knows how things are to be done. Um, it sets the standards. It sets the, the rules, if you like, so that people know where they stand. And then the issue around benefits packages. It's been quite interesting. Um, I've certainly seen reference to uh, a new sort of terminology about um, remote working packages. And, and that's really around who bears the cost, uh, who bears the cost of equipment at work, who bears the cost of telephone calls, assuming of course people don't have work mo mobiles, who assumes the cost of Wi-Fi, uh, who, who assumes the cost of um, heating, for example where somebody's being required to work from home remotely all the time. So it will be interesting because there is certainly uh, research out there that suggests that there's quite a lot of employees who expect their employers to pick up those costs. I think it's a bit different if you're looking at hybrid working. Um, you only have to look at the cost, for example, of commuting and think, well, if I don't have to commute five days a week, I'm only going to be in the office three days a week. Um, the cost saving potentially is balanced out by the cost of working from home and having, having to heat a particular area where you work. So again, it's about having a sensible conversation around this. And then benefits packages, um, I suppose we might call it the kind of the work perks, um, important in relation to recruitment. You know, it's the kind of thing people are going to be looking at, but it's equally important in terms of, you know, retaining your current workforce. So some of the things that we know employers have done during this sort of exceptional period, um, putting on extra provision around mental health, virtual exercise classes, um, some organisations that recognise people's birthdays, for example, that kind of thing. Those are the sorts of things that you might want to continue with. They might be part of the glue that helps you retain your existing workforce. There's also quite an interesting um, uh, discussion that I've seen around um, a particular type of leave that I think may be quite prevalent now. We, we know that lots of people have gone out and, and bought pets whilst we've been in lockdown. Lots of new puppies. Uh, we've seen them zoom bombing our, our calls. It's always a delight, uh, if you like dogs. Uh, and um, there is this concept, and it's a pre-COVID concept, of paternity leave. That period that you, know, you can take to settle in your new puppy. Um, the converse of that, I guess, is 
you know, will your new puppy start to have withdrawal symptoms and feel anxious because you're no longer around? So it's a bit tongue in cheek, but you know, there are organizations that have introduced that, maybe something to think about. And, and then something that did make me smile, um, Nespresso Professional, um, the coffee maker, um, uh, carried out a survey uh, and there were a substantial proportion of people, apparently 80% of the people they surveyed, said they'd really welcome their employer making uh, provision for um, coffee solutions at home. So who knew, but uh, uh, understandably, I, I suspect they were very keen to um, publicize that particular uh, uh, survey result. And then one other thing on pay, and it's, this is really more around the national minimum wage issue when we are back in the office, if you're going to have uh, hot desking arrangements, for example, be aware that for staff where you're paying at um, or around national minimum wage rates, if those people have to turn up to work before their contractual working hours begin in order to take a kit out of a locker, set up a, or find a hot desk, set up a hot desk, and then at the end of the day, clear the desk they've been sitting at, put those items back in a locker, that time is likely to be counted as working time by HMRC. So just uh, be aware of that. Uh, and then moving on to one of the uh, next considerations. I think the issue around wellbeing is, is really important. This has risen up the board agenda massively in the last 12 months and rightly so. I think in the early days, there was a huge sense of camaraderie in many workplaces. Um, certainly, I know in our team, we had daily catch ups on Zoom to make sure that we were checking in with everybody to make sure everyone was OK. Um, I think what's happened is that as time has gone on, and particularly as we've had lockdown two and lockdown three and a, a sense of this is a never ending um, conveyor belt of, uh, of, of kind of restrictions, we've seen a real toll um, on health and well-being. We've seen people struggling with their working environments where their working environments were never set up for them to work remotely. Um, homeschooling, when schools and, and nurseries and so on closed, um, having to kind of balance those needs, the, the, the guilt really of knowing that you, know, you had work to do, but equally you've got children who needed to be supported so that they didn't fall behind in their education. People missing the buzz of the office, that opportunity to just have those chats. You know, what did you do at the weekend? Can I talk to you about this issue? What do you think about X? You know, all of that kind of interaction really, really adversely affected by this. So some people also struggling, of course, with isolation. If you live on your own, this is a really, really hard time. And we know from uh, a survey uh, that was prepared by Resilience First that a really considerable number of people are now suffering from working from home fatigue. It's becoming harder productivity is starting to fall. And so the idea that we may be able to rejoin our colleagues face to face, um, and we don't want any hiccups along the way to that return is becoming really important. So in terms of looking ahead, again, it's a case of not losing what we've learned through this experience, making sure that you continue to focus on mental health issues, to support individuals, to make sure that issues around mental health awareness continue to be raised, so that interaction um, and intervention can be very early before people um, really, really begin to struggle. Working on how you integrate new starters, dealing with issues around isolation and regular check-ins with people. And of course, hopefully what that then does from my perspective as an employment lawyer, it avoids that risk of those Equality Act claims for people who have struggled um, with mental health and also with physical health in terms of working from home and perhaps not being um, quite kitted out in the way they should have been despite risk assessments being carried out. So the next uh, section is in relation to um, the working environment. Um, I reached out to my health and safety colleagues um, just to ask whether there was anything um, new on the horizon, anything of you know interest and I was told that actually no, it's the same old requirements in relation to ensuring that you are looking after the health and safety of your workforce, making sure that working environments are safe there are safe systems of work and carrying out risk assessments. So there's nothing terribly new to say there, but obviously if you are going to have hybrid working models, those will continue to be ongoing uh, requirements. 
So moving on to the next issue, which is around this whole piece around engagement, collaboration, and culture. And, and this is really what I think um, that the Goldman Sachs quote was really about, you know, how do you keep people engaged and how do you collaborate? And how do you avoid all of this impacting adversely on the culture of your business, culture of your organization? Because, you know, we are social creatures, um, well, most of us are social creatures and we want to be with other people. Um, there's some really interesting uh, research out there about um, the benefits really of focusing on tasks. So if you want people to be engaging, to be creative and to be collaborative, that will be best uh, done in an office environment. If you want people to focus on individual work tasks, that's probably going to be best done if somebody's working at home. So I think it's about looking at what people do in your organisations, um, what you require of them, and then looking to see whether there is a, a way of uncoupling some of those activities so that you can accommodate a hybrid working model. And I think really importantly, there is this risk of a two-tier workforce. I think we saw that to some extent uh, with the furlough scheme last year, that people who were furloughed um, uh, sitting, well, sitting at home, there wasn't any really anywhere else for them to go, but sitting home at home and being paid, whilst other people were working, um, creating sort of resentment in some organisations. Uh, and I think we need to be really alive to that risk that you don't have a two-tier workforce because we know that in some sectors, it is not possible for people to work from home. So they won't have this hybrid working model. It's going to be really important to make sure that we are engaging with people. And we don't want frontline workers to feel that somehow they are second class um, or that they're getting the uh, a raw deal from their employers. So I think it's really important to make sure that we look at other ways perhaps of ensuring that we're engaging with workers where, for example, they don't have that flexibility. And then moving on to the issue around equalities, I, I think the impact of the last 12 months has really shone a light on the issue of, of uh, equalities. Um, we had uh, uh, research published by the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which showed some real inequalities uh, in a general sense. Um, and they found that, you know, from a financial perspective, um, those who were best able to work from home tended to be those who were on higher incomes. Women were really advert or have been really adversely affected by the pandemic. Um, the rates of female uh, employment were at a record high at the beginning of the pandemic, but actually we know there's lots of survey and lots of research results out there that show that women um, have taken or borne the brunt of childcare, housework and so on. Um, that's obviously not true in every situation, but that's the general feedback. Uh, and we need to find a way of remedying, remedying that. And we know that um, younger workers have missed the buzz of the office, but also might find it more difficult to have a working environment that's really suitable for remote working. And we know that people of uh, Pakistani, Bangladeshi and uh, black ethnicity have been most affected either because they work in sectors that have closed down or because they work in sectors where it's not possible to work from home. And geographically, apparently, if you uh, work in or if, you, if you're in London, um, then uh, you're the most likely people to be able to work remotely from home, according to the information from um, the uh, Institute of Fiscal, of the Fiscal Studies. So we need to be mindful that hybrid working arrangements don't perpetuate those general inequalities. And then we need to move on to the issue around disability in particular. Um, we know that employers have worked really hard over the years since the introduction of the Disability Discrimination Act back in 1996 um, to make sure that workplaces are adjusted. Um, so we know that um, in that sense, uh, from a physical disability perspective, um, lots and lots of people have already been accommodated. I think one of the harder things actually is going to be around the invis invisible disability. Um, uh, issues. So, for example, um, where you're dealing with neurodiversity issues, so ADHD and autism and so on, actually, the idea of having a fully flexible office working space with hot desks and so on might be really, really difficult for some people. If they need quiet space, they need less sensory um, stimulation, 
um, being, you know, at a desk which is right by the door with people coming and going might actually be really detrimental to people in that situation. You might have people with um, sensory issues around hearing and sight issues where, you know, location is really important. You might have people where they've got particular kit, which actually means that they need a fixed desk, that, that hot desking doesn't work. Um, and you may also have a situation where people are quite anxious about the idea of turning up in the morning without knowing where they're going to be sitting. Uh, and that needs to be accommodated. So lots of things to think about, lots of things to engage. And actually, perhaps one of the most important issues, how will you know? If you don't know who in your workplace has a disability, who might need some of these additional considerations, how will you be able to meet that need? So I think we need to be very mindful about the quality of the data that is held in this particular area. And again, one of the ways of dealing with that, of course, is to engage, whether that's through networks or whether that's through, um, uh, you know, actually engaging with staff and carrying out staff surveys. And then flexible working request, a couple of headlines there. Um, the first is that, as you know, um, under the uh, statutory provisions, you have to work for your employer for 26 weeks before you uh, have that right to make a request for flexible working. CIPD is campaigning for that to be a day one right, and for lots of our clients and lots of organisations, um, that 26 week qualifying period isn't applied. But what do we know about flexible working requests? Well, we know that we're going to get more requests. All the research said that. We're likely to get more requests from men. We know that people are looking at how they might uh, change their working arrangements. Southampton University has done a really interesting piece of research revealing that 64% of fathers and 59% of mothers wanted to reduce their hours to spend more time with their families. So if we bear that in mind, what does that give rise to in terms of kind of the legal issues? Um, the first, I think, is an issue around how you deal with these requests. Back in 2014, when the um, law changed, so you didn't have to say why you wanted to work flexibly, we know that um, uh, there was an expectation that there would be a sort of floodgates of, of applications and there weren't, but here it's different. People have had 12 months to get used to a new way of working. And they might want to continue some of those elements of that way of working. So how do you prioritize? Um, ACAS suggests that what you do is you look at things on a first come first serve basis, which is fine, but what you can't lose sight of is that you need to be balancing uh, how you approach that with people's rights under the Equality Act. So we might have a situation where a flexible working request is actually about a reasonable adjustment for somebody with a disability. It might be that the request could give rise to an indirect sex discrimination claim from a female employee and equally give rise to a direct sex discrimination claim from a male employee. We may have a situation where indirect religious discrimination issues might arise if you're requiring somebody to work on a particular day, for example. So I think we just need to be really mindful that this is a balancing act. Um, the eight statutory reasons for refusing still uh, hold good. So we need to make sure that we factor all of that in. So moving on to the next slide, um, in terms of dealing with um, performance issues, do you wipe the slate clean in relation to current performance issues to give account to the fact that this is not normal for people? You need to be thinking about how you get your managers to deal with uh, performance managing a hybrid workforce. We need to be clear that managers are trained, that they are confident to be able to do that. And then work allocation raises all sorts of potential inequalities issues. Out of sight, out of mind. Can't be like that. You need to make sure that people are given, are given work, that they aren't going to be in a situation where they might suggest, for example, that they're being discriminated against. And of course, there's a whole issue there around uh, avoiding uh, people saying that their career development has been uh, effectively curtailed by uh, hybrid working practices. So I'm just going to move on now in relation to the next slide. And all I really wanted to flag here, because there, this is a sort of a whole day in itself, um, there are legal considerations in relation to um, monitoring. And I have listed on that slide um, all the things that organisations need to think about Monitoring is particularly important because we know people um, have reported that employers have been buying surveillance kits 
Um, that doesn't necessarily suggest you trust your workforce, but um, it's understandable why organisations might do that. But we just need to be very mindful of balancing all those legal obligations uh, with the actions that impact on your uh, workforce. So I'll leave that one with you because that is a topic in itself and then move on to deal with the next issue, which is the issue around uh, who else to include. And again, I'm sure you're doing this, but this is multidisciplinary. You can see how many different stakeholders there are here. And it's really important to engage uh, as uh, if you're in the HR team, to be looking at engaging with um, everybody who's on that slide in, in my view. So I'm now going to look at, uh, and this is relatively briefly, but I'm going to look at location-based pay. Um, we are likely to see a move towards location premiums being removed if you can work from anywhere. We know that uh, organisations are starting to look at a wider range of um, uh, talent when it comes to recruitment so that your talent pool will be broader because you don't have people that necessarily need to be within commuting distance of particular uh, office location for example and that might even entail looking uh, outside the UK which brings with it all sorts of issues around uh, what people expect to be paid in terms of uh, whether they get paid at a local rate or they get paid at a UK rate. Um, we know that um, there is an issue here in relation to balancing employee savings. I've already touched on that. Um, employers may be prepared to take a pay cut, for example, uh, if they can see that there's a saving to them. Um, and then on the social diversity piece, well, it's, it's arguable, isn't it? You could say, well, this will give us an opportunity to uh, widen the range of people that we can recruit. But equally, if you don't have an office, how do we bring all those people together so people can work together uh, in a really socially diverse way? So moving on to the issue around uh, how you change pay, um, I just wanted to mention just a couple of things. There are practical considerations uh, in relation to um, pay. So, uh, you know, how we deal with the issue of, you know, being based everywhere and how you deal with the messaging for the workforce. Um, but from a legal perspective, the really big issue is going to be how you deal with varying pay. Um, from my perspective, um, if we're talking about contracts, they probably don't contain a sufficiently wide variation provision to be able to do that um, without um, some kind of engagement with the workforce. Um, express agreement, great, particularly where lots of employees are saying that, you know, in order to be uh, able to access more hybrid work and they would take a pay cut, that's great, but that's unlikely to be universally agreed. Um, and ordinarily we would say, well, there's the issue around unilateral imposition or offering uh, well, dis offering some dismissal re-engagement as the mechanism. So dismissing somebody and offering them um, opportunity to deal with this on a different basis. Um, the problem here is that there's been some recent development. Um, there's a claim that's just been lodged in the High Court by Usdor. They obtained what in effect was an injunction up in Scotland against Tesco's, which actually prohibits Tesco's from implementing um, or imposing rather uh, reductions in pay or doing the fire and rehire, the dismissal re-engagement route. Um, and as uh, last week on the 18th of March, um, lodged a similar uh, claim in the High Court. Um, so that may well curtail employers' flexibility. So I raise that because that's going to be an important consideration if you're looking at issues around um, varying pay. Uh, and then in relation to um, other issues, other risks, just be alive to the fact that you you don't want to inadvertently create an equal pay issue here. So just be very mindful about how you approach um, pay reductions. Um, on the next slide, I, I've just covered um, something which I've seen suggested. Um, this is about, you know, can you say, well, the change in place of work effectively gives rise to a redundancy situation. It'll be interesting to see how a tribunal would approach that. Arguably, it fits into the legislation, but it seems to me that Again, it's a bit of a sledgehammer to crack a nut, I would suspect, and you will have all the usual consultation obligations triggered. So just be very mindful about that. And then very finally, just moving on to the issue about uh, sustainability, if you're conscious of time and wanting to ensure we've got time for questions. Um, sustainability seems to be on every agenda. Um, it really is important. The research says that our workforce of the future are, are really quite activist in this area. They're not passive. 
you know, they are really challenging the agenda. And so if, if you as organizations, um, and that includes our firm, want to engage and, and, and attract future talent, we need to be uh, showing our credentials. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be uh, engaging with the existing workforce, of course, and we should be doing that in any event and seeking ideas and what have you from the existing workforce. And then just a very interesting issue around sustainability from my perspective, you may have seen this. There's an organisation called the Chancery Lane Project. Um, they're a collaboration of lawyers who are seeking to develop new contracts and policies um, that actually reflect uh, and help fight climate change. Um, and some of the things they are suggesting is we have contracts um, that talk about, um, you know, being carbon neutral, um, having a zero, um, sorry, talking about also things like um, climate sabbaticals, so paid leave to go off and work on projects that have a particular focus on the environment, as opposed to unpaid traditional sort of sabbatical. Um, provisions around sustainable commuting policies, so people, you know, be encouraged to take public transport, work, uh, walk to work, um, reducing business travel uh, as an organisation, which is something over which, of course, you can control. And I would suggest that over the last 12 months, uh, we know um, is possible. Um, Zoom is great, and Teams or whichever platform you use. So do we need to be jetting off anywhere, even if we could? And, and then finally, one of the areas that they're looking at also is about uniforms. Um, you know, where are you getting your uniforms from? Um, are we discouraging employees from the kind of fast fashion approach to uh, work clothing and so on? Um, all very interesting. Um, I would definitely recommend looking at their site. Um, it's really interesting. So that's the um, Chancery Lane project. See the kind of things they're thinking about, because uh, I think that that's the kind of thought provoking conversation that we should probably be having in the workplace. So. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to hand back to Tim. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. Yes, I mean, that that's really, really interesting. Thank you so much for your, your time on this, Anna. And um, yes, the questions have been <laughs> piling up while you've been going through that. So that's good. That obviously shows how, how engaged everyone is. So um, I've been trying to frantically note them down. So I, I'm going to just try and do some of the um, uh, some of the in no particular order. So there was one question. Um, are there problems with uh, people wanting to remote um, uh, to work remotely from abroad uh, at all? So are there any problems? around that yeah i mean leaving aside the whole issue about pay because if you've got a, a foreign um office or foreign location um how you pay, pay people and make sure that that's fair um there are issues about whether that creates potential conflict with um the labor laws in that particular jurisdiction um there are issues about tax and social security contributions and how those are accounted for um and then uh, i guess from an employer perspective not wanting to inadvertently create uh, that particular location as a place of business if you don't already have a presence in that jurisdiction. Yeah. Okay. Now that's great. Um, no, thank you for that. That, that that's that one. Uh, sorry, someone asked a, a simple question. I will we'll be sharing the slide deck. Yes, we we will afterwards and the recording as well. I link to the recording. So uh, uh, we'll, uh, uh, if you've missed anything in, in here or it's, uh, it's gone too quickly, I'm sure uh, you'll be able to get, get that. Uh, another question, if working from home is a voluntary option going forward for staff, do we have uh, a responsibility to provide equipment uh, for home working? So we talked about heating and, and things like that, but what about equipment? Yeah, that's, that's really tricky. Um, I know from discussions with clients kind of pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, um, that uh, if you wanted to work from home, um, obviously, you know, if you've got your work laptop, then that, that's obviously provided for. But if you wanted a, a big screen or a chair, for example, or a desk, um, that would be your responsibility. I, I do wonder whether there will be a change, even if what you want to do is on a voluntary basis, um, because actually don't forget, of course, that there are still health and safety obligations to ensure that people have a safe uh, working environment. So if somebody has a particular need, um, I think you will have to look at it on an individual basis. And, and of course, if somebody wants to work voluntarily, but there is a particular adjustment which is uh, a reasonable adjustment for the purposes of the Equality Act that would need to be provided. Okay, 
Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I don't know whether you can answer this uh, quickly um, now or whether maybe come back to it as one of the other <laughs> questions. Um, I'd really appreciate a quick recap of employment contract changes for people in, in employment pre-April 2020. Right. OK. Um, we saw the introduction back in, um, I think it was on the 6th of April last year, it feels like a very long time ago, <laughs> new provisions for Section 1 statements, which were um, quite different to the pre-existing position. They, they only applied as a day one right to new starters after the 6th of April, but there's a little tweak in the legislation that says if you change the terms and conditions of your existing workforce, then you need to make sure that the contractual documentation in place um, going forward uh, actually meets the new Section 1 requirements. Uh, so there's an issue about whether you do that. There are organisations that um, have taken the view that the, the new provisions are quite prescriptive and have provided that employees are able to access that information, um, even if it's not in the Section 1 statement. That's as good as compliant. And, and the sanctions haven't changed dramatically. It's still not a standalone claim to the Employment Tribunal. Um, you have to tag it onto another claim. And even then the tribunal can only award between two and four weeks pay, which is, well, from April this year, it's going to be capped at £544 a week if, if you earn that much. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Anna. That, that's, that's great. Um, does working from home create any insurance considerations for the employer? Um, I don't know if it creates any insurance considerations for the, in, for the employer. I can check that with my health and safety colleagues. The insurance consideration I think I would have is actually around your own domestic arrangements um, and then about whether you need to tell your household insurer that actually you're now working from home. Um, and obviously different policies will have different provisions. Um, from, from my perspective, I think as long as the employer can show that it's carried out appropriate risk assessments and so on, that, that there shouldn't be an issue from an employer's perspective. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, you mentioned the contractual issues around a potentially changing place of work if employees have traditionally been full-time office working and you want them to work uh, from home for part of the week. Do you recommend we change the contract to reflect this, first of all, uh, and would the employees have two places of work then? Um, so could you just talk through the practicalities of, of this, if you can, in, in one and a half minutes? <laughs> well, I mean, there is an obligation. One of the Section 1 obligations is to identify the place of work. So I think if we were being very, um, wanted this to be very clear, then I think the contract should reflect that if it is a formal permanent arrangement in just the same way as you would confirm a flexible working arrangement in writing. Um, to reflect the permanence uh, of that arrangement. Um, I guess it becomes trickier when you start to get into the realms of, um, so for example, redundancies. If you're closing a place of work, uh, but you've got an individual who has two places of work in the contract. Um, having said that, um, I suspect in that situation, you'd still be able to meet the uh, requirement to show that you know you need fewer employees so that you would trigger that definition in any event. Um, I do think it's I do think it's actually uh, from a transparency perspective and it really important that employees and employers are very clear about the arrangements. Um, and I'm thinking in particular there about um, where, for example, there is a change of management um, that the individual's arrangements, you know, if it has been formally agreed that that person will work from home set days or or you know however that's arranged um, from home and then set days in the office um, I think it's really important that the individual understands that but also that anybody who is managing that individual understands that as well so that we don't get potential risks of breach of contract claims arising Okay, I'm really interesting. Okay, we've got lots. Uh, we do have some more questions, but um, we've run out of time. So what we'll, we'll we've noted them all down, and we will uh, send a we'll uh, get get Anna to answer them. <laughs> I hope you don't mind, Anna. Um, uh, and then we can uh, come back to you. Um, I guess it's just um, because we've run out of time now, and I know everyone has busy days. So I uh, just wanted to say thank you so much, Anna, for your time today. It's been fascinating uh, hearing about this, and it's obviously a moving feast.
Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining today. Thank you yeah. everyone else for joining today. And uh, we hope to see you next time. So in the meantime, stay safe and um, hope to speak to you again soon. Have a good rest of the week. Bye-bye now. Bye.